it is a commodity. And, and Bitcoin in particular, it is digital gold, right? It is this store of value that's more divisible and more portable. So it has all the scarcity of gold, but it's better. And I, I meant to tweet this, but I, I, I just got lazy and I didn't go find the pictures. But, you know, there's an un- interesting thing about Bitcoin that traditional commodities don't have. And there was the, and, and what I was inspired by is after JP Morgan, you know, after Jamie was talking, someone tweeted the picture of, hey, Jamie, uh, at least Bitcoin's verifiable because there was a story that JP Morgan bought a bunch of nickel, right? The, the, the mineral. And it was in a warehouse and literally they opened the bags. It was full of rocks. It wasn't nickel. In a recent discussion, Mark Yusko, a prominent figure in the investment community, delved into the intricate dynamics of Bitcoin, Bitcoin ETFs, and the broader macroeconomic landscape. Yusko, known for his deep insights and boisterous commentary, began by giving his analysis of the Bitcoin market, which was particularly incisive. He pointed out the substantial daily inflows of Bitcoin into cold storage, emphasizing the underappreciated supply dynamics at play. Despite the market's skepticism, he argued that the Bitcoin ETFs had been a resounding success, citing their impressive trading volumes and inflows. He noted that these ETFs, including the Newborn 9, had managed to secure top positions in trading volumes among U.S. ETFs, a testament to their burgeoning acceptance and success. However, Yusko didn't shy away from addressing the challenges, particularly the outflows from GBTC and the market's failure to fully grasp the implications. He criticized the market's myopic view, especially in underestimating the impact of events like the Chinese New Year and the tax season in the U.S., which traditionally lead to significant Bitcoin sales. Let us now dive deeper into these details with Mark Yusko. Don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe, and drop your comments as you watch. There's a whole bunch of holders that bought GBTC when the price was 10, 15, you know, K. They're not selling. <laughs> Irregardless of, of what the, the fee is, you can charge them 10%. They're not going to sell because you're not going to take a tax hit and pay a huge amount of those gains away just to save, you know, 1% or you know, 120 basis points. And, and clearly that's what Grayscale was banking on. Now, all the money in the tax exempt accounts, IRAs, retirement accounts, that's, that's going. And, you know, by most estimates that I've seen, that's about 15, 20%. I don't think anybody knows exactly uh, of their assets. And I think what, what people just don't appreciate I don't think they appreciate is, you know, Grayscale, yes, it was $25 billion. Yeah. WM, but they didn't raise $25 billion. Yeah. I don't know the exact number, but my gut is it's around 10 ish billion. And that money came in in the last bull run. And what people just, they've forgotten that big first move from 10 to 60 before the famous Elon quote, most of that was GBTC, right? You had, you know, six, eight billion dollars coming into a market that was still, you know, reeling from the previous bear market before the last bear market. And, you know, someone, I was, somebody was, was uh, going after Eric uh, on Twitter yesterday saying, you know, your, your numbers are wrong. I've never seen a $3 billion inflow without, you know, prices mooning. He said, well, you know, like he said, Holmes, the, 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 the numbers are right. So yeah, you're just missing a variable. And that variable that this person is not paying attention to is the sales. And the other thing that people aren't talking about, and I don't understand because it happens every single year, is Chinese New Year. Mm. Chinese New Year is coming and they got to fill the red envelopes with cash. So they sell Bitcoin. And this year, the sales are going to be worse than a normal year because you had big gains. And then we're going to have another one in you know late March, early April, where people are going to have to sell to pay Uncle Sam. So these seasonal things, they happen. And the good news 
you know, like my socks, the penguins are going to be out there snatching it all up and stuffing it away at Coinbase. <laughs> the amount of money that's going to be made, both in fees and transactions, is, is going to be really good for these companies. And I think people are just lost in the weeds for some, re some reason. And I mean, it's our own fault community-wise. You know, I actually uttered the word God candle just like everybody else. And that was, you know, clearly not smart <clears throat> because my 30 billion number was never a day one number, right? 30 billion is 0.1% of the 30 trillion. That was never a day one number. That was over time. And I will say, I did not believe, and I still kind of don't believe it, that three of the largest groups that I'm counting on all accepting this, you know, finally and saying, yes, we're going to put it in the models, Merrill Lynch, UBS, and uh, Vanguard basically got a call from Ms. Warren. You're like, well, you can't say that for sure. I'm like, well, well, I can say whatever I want. I'm boisterous, remember? So uh, I can say that. And, and I believe that's what happened. <clears throat> I think Ms. Warren gave him a call and said, nope, you're not taking it. Yusko also touched upon the broader implications of regulatory decisions, such as the re-evaluation of the Chevron Doctrine, and their potential to reshape the power dynamics between regulatory agencies, the legal system, and Congress. He criticized the SEC's sweeping claims to regulate the crypto space, drawing parallels with the collectible market and commodities, and highlighted the growing disconnect between the legal system's view of tokens and the SEC's stance. Shifting the focus to the macroeconomic landscape, Yusko expressed concerns about the outdated methods used to gauge the job market, particularly the birth-death ratio. He acknowledged the tightness in the lower levels of employment, but contrasted it with the significant layoffs in big tech companies, suggesting a nuanced and segmented labor market. Let's hear all he had to say about that. I do believe, and probably this is despite the, the you know, this could be not, not favorably perceived, but despite the illusion that there's some invasion at the border, um, I think our immigration policy has changed a lot in the last eight years. And we just don't have people because the boomers aren't going to do that job, right? They're just not. And the, there's this trough between the boomers and the millennials that there was a baby bust. And so there's just not enough people. And maybe part of it is... You know, it's a college town, the college kids, they're not actually going to do the work. They, they got credit cards and they're going to go, you know, do the brunch. I don't think there's a lot of unemployment at that level, but there's a huge amount of unemployment, but I don't think they file claims. Like if you're laid off from Google, I just don't believe those people are going and standing in line to file a claim. I don't yeah. think, I don't think, yeah. I, I, and it could be wrong. I could be totally wrong. It's a million people have been laid off by big tech in yeah. the past year. And that to me seems like a big number. And again, I would think those people, they got good severance packages. They, they have some stock. I don't think they are filing claims. Like if you're a factory worker or a, or a construction worker or a day laborer, you're going to show up and you're going to do, you're going to file your claim. Now, again, maybe I'm, missing the boat on that. But that's that's my only justification is there are certain parts about the economy that look so strong, like waiting two hours to get a brunch. But then there are other parts of the economy. You look at the empire state number. Yeah. Oh, huge mess. Horrible. Huge mess. I mean, yeah. horrible. You look at uh, well, Cam Harvey, Right, you know, down at down at Duke, he's got this recession indicator. You know, it's undefeated, eight for eight, and saying this time it's saying the same thing. Um, you got the Druckenmiller indicator, which is a combination of things. Bank lending, oh, bank lending went negative only for the second time in a hundred years. So there what are does things. Bank lending go negative. Uh, growth rate. Oh, okay. Growth okay. rate of loans. Okay. Okay. Right, the got growth it. rate of demand for loans. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. It's like when people say, you know, inflation has been eradicated. You know, the White House says inflation. No, we got the growth rate back to a level that it was when you came into office, but that's still 3% of growth in inflation. And that's, 
still understated, but but it's growth rates versus actual nominal values. The SEC's recent decision to approve nearly a dozen Bitcoin ETFs was hailed as a major win for crypto. But not by everyone. On X, Twitter, a disgruntled faction of the cryptocurrency community cried foul over the alleged heresy of a Bitcoin product custodied and marketed by the likes of BlackRock. The most common objection seems to be that Bitcoin doesn't need an ETF and that using intermediaries to purchase it, particularly ones from Wall Street, perverts the ideal of decentralization. On the other end, people like a self-described researcher Chris Bleck went so far as to suggest that BlackRock and others might conspire to alter Bitcoin's core features. And OG Bitcoiner Max Kaiser warned of a scenario where the Bitcoins held by ETFs get confiscated by the US government. This outcry is misguided. A Bitcoin ETF is a great thing for furthering the original mission of the Bitcoin project, and it's a safe bet that Satoshi Nakamoto, wherever he is, is nodding happily at this new tool to acquire his creation. Recall, Bitcoin is meant to be a type of peer-to-peer -peer digital cash that can't be usurped by the whims of any intermediary. And if Bitcoin is meant to enable individuals to be their bank, an ETF strengthens its case as a store of value. The way a store of value works is that you buy it with excess savings and sell it when you need to consume it at a later point. The way a censorship-resistant, seizure-resistant store of value works is that you buy it when you need the protection it affords you and sell it when you don't. To put it another way, spot Bitcoin ETFs help solve the last-mile problem for cryptocurrencies. The cryptocurrency market has, to date, been saturated by ideologues and gamblers. The appearance of audited vehicles holding Bitcoin creates more liquidity globally, without alienating potential users by burdening them with esoterica that early ideologues, like me, readily tolerated. Instead of committing to finding security solutions that usually resemble a Rube Goldberg machine, the marginally interested crypto-curious consumer can now enjoy an easy entry into this grand experiment. Bitcoin may not need an ETF, but it certainly needs an alternative to safety deposit boxes and ledger devices. Average folks, not just the tech savvy, who are Bitcoin curious, can now contribute to Bitcoin's liquidity by dipping their toe into the ETF pool. Ultimately, this should be celebrated by even Bitcoin's most old-school believers, not to mention the people using it as a lifeline. Will Bitcoin become the savior of the financial system? Let's hear your thoughts in the comment section below. Also remember to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications. Thanks for watching.